And good afternoon again. This is Susan from Learn Times, and I'd like to welcome you to our Connecting to Collections webinar today. Uh, if you have not already, please introduce yourself in the chat area over to the left. Go ahead and tell us who you are and maybe what institution you're affiliated with. This seminar webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to review it later on. But right now, I am going to turn it over to Elsa Huxley from Heritage Preservation to walk you through what's going to happen. Thanks, Susan. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Elsa Huxley from Heritage Preservation, and we're so glad you're joining us today. Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Times. The goal of this online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we have drawn on many resources that were developed for the Connecting to Collections initiative, including the bookshelf, the Raising Web Bar workshops, and previous webinars. And links to all of those resources are filed under the Topics menu on the site. We'll also file a recording of today's webinar there and include some of the resources that we discuss in these presentations. About once a month, the Connecting to Collections online community features a particularly helpful preservation resource, and we host one of these webinars related to it. The resources we posted for today's webinar can be accessed by clicking this photo on our webpage. That's www.connectingtocollections.org. So today, we want to welcome Mary Fahey, who is the chief editor at the Henry Ford Museum, and Derek Moore, curator of transportation at the Western Reserve Society. Mary and Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. Could you tell us a little bit about Mary? Do you want to go oh, first? Sure. I'm a graduate of the um, State University of Buffalo, where I, I um, received my bachelor's degree in uh, fine art with a minor in chemistry. And then I went on to complete my master's program at the State University College at Buffalo in the art conservation program that was known as the Cooperstown program. I spent some time in between undergraduate school and graduate school working at the Margaret Woodbury Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. And after I graduated, um, I began working here at the Henry Ford. And I've been here for, I think, over 20 years at this point. Um, here, our collection is, is, if anybody's been here, very large and very diverse. I'm an object conservator uh, by training. And um, after having worked here for a little while, I spent some time working on at least the sculptural aspects of these. Um, so I'll be talking little bit about that today, whereas Derek will address the um, mechanical um, aspects of maintaining uh, vehicles. Thanks, Mary. Derek? Well, I'm Derek Moore. I'm the uh, Crawford Curator of Transportation at the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I studied at uh, Michigan University. University and Eastern Michigan University for my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, history, uh, museum studies, and technology studies. Um, and I am currently studying uh, for my master's degree in uh, technology studies as well at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I've also done coursework in automotive restoration um, at a uh, community, Washtenaw Community College in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, I did an internship at the Alfred P. Sloan Museum in their uh, automotive restoration uh, facility that they have at the museum there, as well as spent the last uh, seven years at the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, six of those were in the conservation department, uh, working under Mary Fahey, and uh, also working for a short time under our objects conservator Malcolm Collum, uh, and did most of the, I was the conservation specialist for transportation collections 
and maintained uh, the, the, really the automotive collections um, at the Henry Ford for the last six years. Um, just recently uh, have accepted the position of the Curator of Transportation here at the Western Reserve. And uh, we have about 160 uh, automobiles in the collection, and um, all of which I am familiarizing myself in these first few years of being here. OK, that's great. Um, we have some poll questions that we could maybe pull over now. We do. Um, you want to start with, uh, with the types of vehicles that may be in your collection? Sure. Does that sound good, Mary and Derek? And Certainly. OK. Sure. Uh, polling us or? or no, we're polling the audience. Or? So the audience is telling us. And in yeah. fact, we of course want to know then if they're operational. Yes. And maybe what decade they're from. That would be helpful. So audience, you'll see three different polls there on your screen. Well, a wide span pre, of time. Pre, a lot of pre-1900s. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's an excellent collection. <laughs> Interesting. OK. And we had a question about how many vehicles they have in their collection. That might be also useful for. Oh, Mary and Derek to know sorry, I didn't see that one oh, yeah. oh, no. buried down there. All right, so tell us your total numbers here. How many vehicles do you have? Wow, more than 15. Ninety percent automobiles. What other kind of vehicles might there be? This is also I'm just curious. Besides automobiles, trucks, vans, tractors that are common in these kinds of collections. Well, I'm I'm wondering, um, and maybe if if people out there can uh, you know type it into the the Q and A box or something based on how you guys want. Um, if there might not be some folks out there that have are, are checking the other box um, due to possible. Um, boat collections or aircraft collections. Oh, wow. Or yeah, that would be great if our participants could type that in so we knew. And for the participants cycle. who haven't said hello yet in that chat window that's over to the left, please tell us where you're coming from. I see a, quite a few people from Dearborn, Detroit. Um, that doesn't surprise me, given the topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we'd love to hear from you. Tell us who you are. Thank you. And anybody that chose other on that question about vehicle type? Oh, there we go. OK. Horse drawn. Oh, horse drawn. OK. Great. OK, I'll move the polls away. And shall we begin with Mary? Sure. OK. Yeah, let me get this. In full size for you, Mary. My mouse is working slowly today. There we go. OK. OK. All right. Well, the care of vehicles 
can be one of the most uh, complicated types of collection to care for. Um, on the first slide are some examples of vehicles from the collections of the Henry Ford um, from a variety of dates. All of the vehicles are consist of composite materials. What I mean by that is, is they have uh, paint and fabric and rubber and metal and you know leather and all sorts of vinyl, at least on the Mustang. Um, and it requires a little bit, their care requires a little bit of an understanding of, of these variety of types of materials. It's important to know when you're caring for vehicles and t deciding on an approach, certainly for conservation treatment or if one should decide to launch a full restoration, it's really important to know the provenance of your vehicle and to be aware of any original materials and parts on your vehicle. The three vehicles that are featured on this page, the Bugatti Royale, the Mustang, and the Locomobile, are vehicles from our collection um, that have uh, significant provenance and significant, just historically, they are, they are very unique vehicles. The Bugatti underwent a restoration sometime, I believe, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, in the 1950s, where its color was completely changed and a lot of the mechanical aspects of the vehicle were also changed. At this point, we're debating whether we want to leave it its current color, which is white and green, or take it back to its original color, which was a black and sort of a yellowish color. Uh, the locomobile on the bottom has a lot of its original paint, and a lot of its it has its original leather, and, and much of the wood and the metal is original. So it was very important for us to maintain those original aspects of that vehicle. Uh, and so, um, you know, you have to sort of work with your, whether you're a curator or a conservator, you have to work together and decide if you're going to undertake conservation or restoration. Is it important to conserve the original materials or do you want to um, restore it to a particular time period that's significant for your organization? And I talked, to, this is a little bit more of what I talked about. It's important to look at your, you know, vehicles and, and to, to actually research even in your own files or in, in acquisition files from way, dating way back to sort of find out what has happened to the vehicle and what has been modified about it. You also need to consider where the vehicle is ultimately going to be displayed and how it's going to be used in exhibitions. Most of, well, actually, almost all of our vehicles are displayed indoors, and we're very fortunate that our museum uh, has climate control. Oftentimes, museums do not have climate control. So this will have an impact on the approach that conservators are taking to conserving or caring for vehicles. It also so should have an impact on sort of what you do to prep your vehicles uh, for storage and, and for long-term display. Because if, if the conditions are not um, conducive to long-term preservation, you may have to go a little further in terms of protecting metals and protecting fabrics and pay a little more attention to sort of uh, what's going on with your collections if you don't have climate control in your museum. Uh, the picture that you see here of our, of our Bugatti Royale is when it was on display obviously outdoors. Vehicles are often sent to displays off-site. And from a conservation aspect, this has an impact on the sort of adhesives we use and in some sense the lacquers we use on vehicles. Because if they're displayed outdoors, uh, there are certain materials that hold up well in that kind of environment and certain uh, materials that do not hold up so well. Mary, it's Elsa. Yes. Could I interrupt for just a second? We have a sure. question from Jeremy in uh, Nebraska about what is, if you could ask, give us your definition of provenance. Oh, provenance is knowing the history of an artifact as it's linked to people or historic events. Like if you know who owned that vehicle and if it, like, like the slide that's up right now is our, is our Lotus 38. 
We know that that vehicle was in an Indianapolis race, and it was a winning, winning car. So provenance is, is the information you have about the vehicle that links it either to people or to important events or things like that, rather than just a Model T that you know nothing about the history of that particular Model T or, or A or something like that. OK, so I have a context. Okay. Yes. Yes. So um, those of you who have vehicles may, um, may have vehicles uh, that are operational and that you drive occasionally or that your institution drives often. We have, at the Henry Ford, have a mixture of, of vehicles. We actually have a whole fleet of Model Ts and Model As that are driven in Greenfield Village on a daily basis. Um, these are vehicles that um, we purchased with uh, the intent of giving rides to visitors with these vehicles. Now, all these vehicles uh, um, do not have a, a significant provenance. They're not, the vehicle in itself is not linked to a famous person or a famous event. And oftentimes, the ones that we purchase for that have been heavily restored. So there's very little original paint, very little original upholstery or anything like that. So for us, that's our, an appropriate choice for operational vehicles. On the other hand, we have significant vehicles like the Lotus 38. And a few years ago, we decided to uh, conserve it to operational condition for a few selected uh, runs. And then once it was driven, those few times, we would um, prepare it just to go on permanent display. Our intention is that it, it won't be driven again anytime in the near future. Um, so it was important to us that this car had been restored a number of times. The exterior, at least, had been repainted. And, but we did find evidence of original materials. The engine itself turned out to be original from the 1965 race, which is very amazing for race cars, because usually the engines are swapped out and replaced. And we also found evidence of original paint in the cockpit where the driver was sitting. The seats were also original. So when we um, when discussed our approach to conserving this vehicle, um, all the factors, including its condition, the cost of the conservation project, the historical significance, the risks of driving it, the need for insurance to cover any uh, catastrophe, catastrophes, and the choice of a driver for this particular car was very important to us. Race cars have a tendency to want to be driven quickly, and it's very hard to drive them slowly. So we wanted to choose a driver that would be conservative and respect the fact that it was a, this was a one-of-a-kind car. We didn't want anybody who was going to get in the car and try to go as fast as possible. Uh, so there were two drivers who we chose um, for this particular car, but it required a lot of discussion before we actually decided who was going to drive it. Um, during conservation and restoration, it's important to keep detailed records of all the work and to keep all of the parts that, that come off the vehicle, whether you're using them or not, because that's all a part of the original history of vehicles. Some examples of conservation um, treatment have to do with cleaning. All of our approaches to cleaning tend to be very conservative. We tend to use traditional conservation materials. Um, on the Henry Ford's website, you can find links to some of our caring for artifact sheets. We use simple uh, soap materials very often, on, especially on painted surfaces. Uh, the soap that we use most often is called Orvis. Um, we try, whenever possible, to consolidate original paint much in the same way that painting conservators take original paint. They wick adhesive underneath it. 
and adhere the paint back down in place rather than strip it off. Some of the pictures you see here, one is of our white steamer car, 1907 vehicle, which has much of its original paint on it. The, the photograph that you see at the center shows the, the poor condition that the paint was in when we started working on it. It was actually just flaking off the surface. We actually went through and set down all the paint and re retained that original material. Um, the, uh, and then we went in and touched the areas where paint were, was missing with color green paint. The uh, cockpit that you see from our Lotus is another area in the vehicle where there was a large amount of original paint. So we decided that even though some areas had been overpainted over the years, we decided not to strip the paint because we knew that there was original paint underneath. If we wanted to at a later date, we could go back and remove the overpaint and reveal uh, the original surfaces on that particular car. Another approach that I just basically touched on is restoration. Sometimes um, museums will decide to approach the care of a vehicle or the display of a vehicle in a restored these conversations, these decisions must involve a lot of conversations between editorial staff, museum leadership, and conservation staff. The uh, the vehicle that you see here is the what we call the Rosa Parks bus. It's the vehicle that Rosa Parks was on when um, she took a stand against um, discrimination. Um, we obtained this vehicle, and it was in the, in the condition that you see in the upper right image. And we made a choice to uh, return the vehicle to the way that it looked and that Rosa Parks would have been riding that vehicle. We did meticulously document the layers of paint, and we will, were able to sort of see evidence of uh, that this actually was the original Rosa Parks bus during our thorough examination of the paint surfaces and on the vehicle. Um, another thing that's, that's important to consider when conserving vehicles is how the metal on different vehicles should look. This is true for carriages as well for older cars and modern cars. Many finishes were originally lacquered, and um, others were meant to be bright at all times, like chrome finishes, some brand finishes like you see here. What we are careful about, though, is to make sure that if there's an original lacquer that has an overall sort of old-timey look that actually matches the look of the paint on a vehicle, we try not to polish it to a bright finish because it doesn't, it sort of isn't in keeping. There isn't sort of a cohesive look to um, a vehicle. If parts are polished and the other parts look sort of old time patinated. An example of this is the fire engine you see in the upper right corner. The brass on that has a nice, stable brownish color. There's no active corrosion on it, so we decided not to pursue polishing it since it was stable. Uh, the vehicle you see in the lower right, we decided that we were going to polish it to a real high polish, which is how it would have looked when someone was actually using the vehicle. The paint was in very good condition, and I believe that it had been repainted. And Derek, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, so we decided to polish that brass, and then we always apply a clear lacquer coating. We do this because if you lacquer it, then first of all, you don't have to polish it again for a long time, and it also protects it from you know, fingerprints and, and from um, more. Um, and just allows it to be in good condition for a longer period of time. Repeated polishing tends to wear on the metal, and it actually wears it away. So you can you can overdo polishing if it's too often. 
Um, we also are careful to make sure that when we polish something, we remove all of the polished residue. You can see the image on the lower left, the whitish material that you see is polished residue that actually sort of spilled onto the wood wooden areas, which can you know, cause damage to, and staining to the wood. Also, if the polish is left on the surface, it can just corrode the metal. And you can end up seeing sort of green corrosion on brass products. So we try to make sure that we clean off any kind of polish that we use. The polishes that we tend to use tend to be uh, very conservative polishes. We don't use Brasso. We don't use things with a lot of ammonia in them, because the ammonia in some of those polishes can actually damage the metal. Uh, we will often mix up our own polish formulations just with alcohol and, and water and, and abrasives mixed together with a little bit of soap. Or the one commercial polish that we do use is called Autosol. It has a little bit of ammonia in it, but um, not enough to actually damage uh, the copper uh, metal that it's used on. Tires and rubber. Um, uh, most vehicles have you know, rubber tires. And rubber itself is a pretty unstable material. It becomes brittle with time. Uh, ozone in the air causes it to degrade. Uh, sunlight and ultraviolet light causes it to degrade. So it's one of those things that you really can't preserve forever. At the Henry Ford, we actually have um, a cold storage room that we use to store materials like rubber and plastic, which slows down the degradation process, but it doesn't actually prevent it from happening. It just slows it down a bit. Uh, there are a number of companies, and, and I think some of the references are listed in our materials, that will produce custom tires. Coker Tire is one of the companies. And but if you're looking for a tire that's not already in production, setup costs for having um, a custom tire made are, are very, very high, like in the $20,000 range. So at times, we've ended up making fake tires. Um, this was in, these images are an example of a tire that we made for one of our vehicles out of pool noodles that you that your children use as floaty devices in the pool. We actually applied a number of different coatings on them and a, um, a rubber paint material to make them look like old-fashioned white tires. We also use, you can also foam fill tires if they don't hold air anymore. That's another approach to take. And we also try to jack stands on many of our vehicles actually allows the vehicle, vehicle to look like it's sitting on the ground, but, but the, the wheels and tires aren't actually touching. This prevents them from developing uh, flat spots on the tire where it's actually sitting on the ground. And if you have tires that aren't holding air very well, if they're up on jack stands, it actually helps them to hold air a little bit longer. Upholstery, whether you're dealing with carriages or, or, or cars, um, you're, you're going to be faced with dealing with a number of different upholstery problems. The um, older upholstery is often made out of wool. Those, these are for cars around the turn of the century, and the same with carriages. They're often made out of wool, and many times they're stuffed with horsehair stuffing. The problem with these kind of materials is that both the wool and the horsehair stuffing attract a whole variety of insects, including carpet beetles, uh, webbing clothes moths, and case-making clothes moths. The important thing to do with these types of vehicles is at least once a year and possibly twice a year, someone has to go inside and use um, 
uh, vacuum attachment to vacuum out the interior. This allows you to keep it clean, and it also deters insects from settling into the upholstery, because they can demolish a vehicle in terms of its upholstery if it's not inspected and cleaned on any kind of regular basis. Other materials like leather uh, become brittle with time. Leather, like rubber, is one of those materials that self-destructs with time, and it's very difficult to preserve it long term. Uh, what we do with our leather is basic cleaning, like dusting or cleaning with a, a, a vacuum cleaner with a brush attachment. Or um, we'll wipe it down with a damp cloth, not too porous. We do not use um, saddle soaps or leather dressing or any of those kind of materials. What I have found through the years is these materials uh, att attract dust. Some of them become moldy with time. And they also, the buildup of, of all sorts of polishes and coatings with time makes it difficult to actually repair the leather if you need to use adhesives, because they actually become kind of slimy with time. And the photo that you see here in the lower right is an example of what we call spewing, which is a leather dressing sort of coming back out onto the surface of, of a leather seat. We do, if we want to use some sort of polish, use uh, Renaissance wax, which is a microcrystalline wax that's available from conservation suppliers. This can be tinted with dry pigments or things like that if you really want to sort of even out the sheen of leather. Um, but it, and it can also easily be removed with mineral spirits. The other type of upholstery that can be challenging to maintain is vinyl. Vinyl is a plastic, um, tends to become brittle with time. And this is because the plasticizers within the vinyl uh, actually leach out onto the surface of the vinyl, um, making them almost sticky. When this occurs, um, there are two approaches to dealing with the vinyl. You can either, sometimes you can just wipe it off the surface with a dry rag, or other times, if it's really sticky, you can take a little bit of mineral spirits on a rag and wipe off the plasticizer. You do have to bear in mind, though, that with time, vinyl just becomes more and more brittle. And you know, long-term preservation um, is, is truly a challenge. And I think, is that the end of mine? I said I think it might be. I think it is. So what I'm hearing there is that over-polishing or over-cleaning can be sort of critical errors to make. Is, are there, is that correct to say? Yes. OK. Are there other common mistakes that you think we should mention today to the participants um, in terms of taking care of the, the, the body of the car? Well, I would, uh, Mary, Mary yes. one, one thing that you might want to talk about um, is some of the problems with um, more, maybe more in depth on, on like leather treatments, like Neat's foot and things like that. Yes, and th those are you know Neat's foot oil and lanolin and saddle soap are definitely things that well we don't use here at the Henry, because um, as I mentioned, and they they sort of interfere um, conservation work down the road, so they might make them look good for the moment, um, down the road it could be detrimental, especially if the leather seams start to fall apart or if you do any rips or things like that. It doesn't hold it together. Um, other common mistakes, um, basically just not, to me, not monitoring and not cleaning the insides of vehicles is, is a big mistake. Because we, we learned ourselves years ago, um, we had some old carriages that were not, nobody cleaned the inside, because you assume that it's sealed tightly. And we went into this one carriage, and insects had basically trashed the upholstery. Mm -hmm. And we ended up um, getting an IMLS grant to help us conserve it. Um, 
and that was something that occurred when it was on display, and it was before there was a, a conservation presence. And and you know, it's just something that you don't think about because you think the doors are closed; it's fine. Right. So it, you can't always assume that that is true. Um, other than that, um, just having a sense of for exteriors of, of your vehicles, it's very important to know whether you have original paint or not. And make a decision about whether you want to keep that or not. Because once it's stripped and repainted, historical information could be gone. So it's important to sort of do your research, take a good look at your artifacts. Oftentimes, we find out there's an old layer of paint underneath newer layers. And sometimes we'll go so far as to remove the upper layers. And it'll we'll be surprised sometimes. It reveals beautiful detail and painting. But it's important to know what you have before you jump in and strip paint off and repaint something. So I think that's a critical thing to avoid as well. OK. I, I just wanted to mention also the list you gave me of um, vehicle references. I have it. Um, I'll pull it over later. But I'll also be posting it online on the page that uh, provides access to the recording of this webinar. So everybody will be able to pull those things out and print them later if they like. OK. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Derek, should we go through your presentation? Does anybody have any other questions for Mary? I mean, you're welcome to ask them later as well. But this can already if you have something that you're thinking about. OK, I think go ahead then, Derek, if you want to start going through yours. Not a problem. Um, it is, you know, we just uh, talked about kind of the um, exterior surfaces um, of the vehicles. Um, I'm going to look at more of the mechanical um, end of having, uh, you know, motorized vehicles in your collection, um, be it, you know, Automobiles, uh, you know, engines. Uh, this, these techniques and methods can be used in aircraft engines, boat engines, um, you know, any anything of that sort. Um, so we're just going to go over some of the key uh, systems within those uh, motorized vehicles and uh, discuss some of the issues that occur within them. Um, and basically, I like to start at the front of the vehicle whenever I work on one and just work my way through it. So that's kind of how I uh, set up this PowerPoint presentation. Um, so the first thing to look at and, and always concern yourself with is, is the cooling systems um, within vehicles. And, and in cooling systems, um, typically, you know, discuss water-cooled uh, engines. Uh, Air-cooled doesn't have too many problems. <laughs> Um, but uh, I also want to look at this in, in two different aspects, um, the display and storage techniques and operational techniques. So you'll see as we go through the slides, display and storage is usually always at the top. Then the operational discussion is uh, on the bottom. Um, for displaying and, and storing vehicles when they're in your collection, and the, the, especially the, the engines um, that have a, a water-cooled system, um, you always want to make sure that whenever the vehicle either comes into your collection or if you've never worked on it and it's in your collection and you pull it out of storage, um, you make sure that the, the cooling system is, is completely dried out. Um, it's And uh, a full, full flush of the system is always good to do. Um, pouring uh, water through it again, I usually use a warm to try to help. Uh, break up any any loose corrosion product or anything like that, and get a good flush. Um, and also, just like a garden hose run through the system, gives a good flow of water through it to help push anything out that might be stuck in it. Um, and then once once you get a kind of a clear water coming out, um, it's uh, the technique that that has been developed is to to fill the system, close the system all back up. Fill it with a mixture of water and water pump lube and a corrosion product um, of the emulsified oil type. Um, and the, the one that I prefer to use is uh, produced by Solder Seal uh, Gunk Company. And it's basically called water pump lube and anti-corrosion. 
um, to drain the system completely after this. What this does is it allows the emulsified oil to flow, mix with the water, flow through the system, and then when you drain it, the thin layer of the emulsified oil will stay behind um, on the walls of the cooling system, therefore creating a, a barrier from oxidation within the system and um, protecting it from any corrosion that might occur in the long term. Um, and then you always want to leave um, the drain petcocks and like the aviator hose disconnected so that as the engine is sitting either in storage or on display um, and you get a type of evaporation of any moisture that is left behind in the system, it's actually allowed to escape from the system rather than being trapped in the system and, and doing a constant kind of circulation of, of evaporating and con condensing and evaporating, and, which will lead to corrosion issues. Um, from an operational standpoint, um, if you are going to operate any of your vehicles in your collection, um, it's highly recommended to not use any glycol-based um, antifreeze uh, type products, um, namely because these vehicles aren't being used, um, number one, in a, in a way, a manner that uh, would necess you know, necessarily need any type of uh, antifreeze type situation, uh, but also because glycol does have effects in the long term once the additive packages break down and can actually lead to corrosion within the system. Uh, typically what is used is just a mixture of the water and water pump lube that I just discussed um, of the emulsified oil type. Um, if you're running the car very infrequently, say once, twice a year at maybe a show or you know here or there, um, it's always a good idea to use a fresh, you know, fresh bottle of the fluid every time, or fresh couple bottles, depending on the size of the system, and to fully drain it after every operation. Um, now, if you're running them more frequently, um, you know, once, twice a month, something like that, you would just want to come up with a, a policy where you would change the fluid, uh, you know, on certain occasions, and or in the case of at the Henry Ford when we were dealing with the vehicles that ran in the village almost year round, uh, basically the entire time the village is open and through the holiday nights, those type of vehicles do use uh, a water antifreeze mixture, but that is due to the situation that they are put in where they need to have extra cooling capacity and, uh, as well as extra antifreeze capacity. So it really oftentimes depends on how your operation of your vehicles um, is going to be handled. And that's true for every slide that we will go. Um, power assisting, uh, power steering, um, obviously, if equipped. I noticed we had a good chunk of vehicles that were prior to the power steering era. But um, in a power steering system, for, dis for display and storage, you typically want to leave the fluid in the vehicle. It's power steering systems are hy hydraulic. Um, and the seals and everything that are hydraulic systems are very dependent on fluid being in there so they don't dry out and start leaking or, or at least dry out and shrink. And then if you ever wanted to use the system again, you would have problems with fluids leaking by as you were trying to use the system. Um, if the system has already been drained by the time it comes into the collection or by the time you actually have the opportunity to work on the vehicle and, and actually go through it. Um, that tends to be more challenging. Um, you, As I said, you may have seals that are bad. Um, if you try to refill it, um, you may have problems with fluid leaking out of the, the system. And really, if you find a vehicle that has the power steering fluid dry, you know, dried out, that's a time to sit back and, and make a decision on the future use of that vehicle and whether or not it should become an operational vehicle and, and really how much work it's going to take and if there's going to be too many alterations to an original power steering system that maybe needs to be preserved. Um, if you move into the thought of operating a vehicle, um, typically if your current fluid seems to be good um, and is, is full or you top it off and test it, um, Hydraulic systems are usually pretty good. You, you don't wind up with a lot of moisture in them. 
um, and and the fluid is a, a good a good fluid that doesn't tend to uh, break down or degrade quickly. It's, it's it takes a very long time. Um, if the current fluid is bad um, or it's dry, and you need to you know replace it, um, you'd want to do a system flush and refill. Um, and then as you're che as you're filling it, you would check for any problems. Um, one of the big things to keep in mind um, would be that there are power steering systems that have been made over the years that once they've gone dry, it is very difficult to refill them and make them operate again properly. Um, some power steering fluid systems, I believe it was Ford Motor Company for a while, and maybe even Chrysler, um, had systems where they would actually have to be filled with high pressure systems to actually blow all of the air out and occasionally would be, if needed to be serviced, they would actually be filled in a vat of hydraulic fluid, power steering fluid, um, because that would allow no air to get into the system. So there are some systems that can be very tricky and you always want to make sure you fully understand the system that you're getting into before doing too much to it. Um, in the lubrication system, um, and lubrication system being the oiling system of a vehicle, um, is this is one of the major areas where you can have significant problems occur in your collections. Uh, the lubrication systems, believe it or not, should always be kept dry, um, drained, flushed, and, and dried out well on display or in storage. Um, you can flush the system with mineral spirits to get rid of any residual oil that was left over. Um, oftentimes removing the oil pan if, if that is easily done. Some cars it's not. Um, you can wipe the pan out, wipe the inside of the crankcase out of the engine block, and make sure everything, all the old oils are out. Um, one of the problems of leaving any type of used oil in a lubrication system um, is that if the oil was in there and the vehicle had operated with that oil in the system, um, you have blow-by of the fuel past the cylinders um, that is being compressed in the top end of the engine. And the hydrocarbons in fuel are actually hygroscopic and will attract moisture. So once you infuse those with the oil, um, you have created a, a basically an irreversible attraction of moisture into the engine. Um, and there's been a number of times um, in, in collecting where I've pulled oil out that hadn't been drained and it had a quarter inch of water sitting on top of it um, because you have a constant condensation and um, uh, evaporation cycle occurring and it just sits on top of the moisture or on top of the oil. Um, and then there's also oil degradation. Um, oil over time will begin to thicken and eventually will actually turn into almost a, a dirt-like product, it, it somewhat reverses um, into a dirt. And there's there's a number of vehicles that I've seen that, um, you know, maybe the engine pan was drained properly, but someone forgot to drain another uh, transmission case or something like that. And it's just been, had to be pulled down and actually broken, the, the thick matter be broken out of it and, and cleaned out to get that out and, and stop any corrosion that had started occurring. Um, if you're going to make a vehicle operational, um, a lot of thought has to go into it. As, as Mary was talking about, you know, you always want to think about the vehicle that you are getting ready to operate um, from originality standpoint, you know, finishes on the vehicle, but then also, you know, mechanical issues with the vehicle. Um, typically, it is, it is highly recommended that uh, modern synthetic oils are used in the vehicles. Um, in an engine that is being run. Um, synthetic oils carry their viscosity rating better uh, over heat range. Um, so on cold startup to full temperature, um, a synthetic oil does not thin out as much as a mineral oil will. Um, and they also have a good additive package. Um, mineral oils have ad good additive packages as well, but the added benefit is the, the viscosity rating staying better over the heat range um, of operation. Um, you also want to make sure that you choose your proper viscosity. Um, typically in a splash uh, system, um, which Model T is many early cars. I know there was a, a good chunk of uh, people 
listening today that had early vehicles in their collection um, typically have splash systems. You want to use a thinner oil, uh, 5W30, 10W30, somewhere in that uh, rating. Um, it allows the oil to move around easier, um, be splashed around the engine easier, um, and actually, in a way, wick into the areas that it needs to flow into uh, much easier. Um, in a full pressure system, um, something like a 20W50 uh, works well. Um, if you have a good pressure pressurized system, it will build pressure quickly. And when you when you shut down and, and do things like that, it will also stay behind and, and stick a little better than some of the thinner viscosities. So it's a, a better fuel uh, fuel a better oil to use in a, a full pressure system. Uh, the next thing to uh, worry about is the s actual cylinders of the engine when you're displaying and storing. Um, again, due to the fact that this is one of the areas that, along with the oil pan and the crankcase area, you can you can have a lot of corrosion occurring. You have metal touching metal, um, and engines tend to see as if they aren't properly taken care of and um, you know lubricated and maintained. So one of the tricks is that when you're getting ready to display or store your vehicle, um, you should always remove spark plugs and add approximately a tablespoon of a synthetic gear oil um, into the cylinders. Um, 75W90, 140 um, are good you know, viscosities. Um, the reason for that is they tend to stick to the cylinder walls and not run down as quickly as a, a motor oil, a 10W or a, a 10W30 or a 20W50. Um, so the, the oil will actually last a little longer on the cylinder. Um, once you've done that um, and you let it sit in there for a minute and flow out, if you turn the engine over for about 30 seconds, um, it'll coat the cylinder walls and it'll also coat the, uh, any of the piston rings, which is, is an area where you can get a lot of corrosion buildup and that will, that is one of the, the main reasons engines tend to seize is that the piston rings will actually seize to the cylinder wall due to corrosion. Um, so you want to get a good oxidation barrier between those two surfaces. Um, now, turning the engine over for 30 seconds, if you're fortunate and you have a very early uh, collection of vehicles, you can easily put the hand crank in and turn the engine over by hand. Um, if you have a vehicle that can only be turned over, say, by the starter, um, that gets a little trickier. Um, sometimes the, on the crank pulley on the front of the engine, they're, they're usually locked on by a, a large nut and you can occasionally get a socket and a breaker bar down in there and be able to turn the engine over but if that's not possible you would want to hook a battery up obviously check your electrical system all over well um, from the battery to the starter and uh, make sure you weren't going to have any problems and remove the the coil wire from the coil to the spark uh, to the distributor for the spark plugs um, that way you don't actually have any you know, spark plugs firing um, and you're not also putting any electricity through the distributor and, and all the electrical components that are there that could have a chance of shorting out. Um, and then turn the engine over just on the starter for about 30 seconds, rolling it over and allowing it to coat the cylinder walls. Um, if you're going to make a vehicle operational, um, the main thing you want to focus on with the engine cylinders um, is to test the compression rate, uh, compression and leak down of the cylinders um, to make sure you don't have any major problems uh, inside the engine. And uh, if you've already done a display or a storage treatment like what we just discussed, um, you'll have a little bit of oil still in the cylinder, and it will be expected that that will burn off on the first test run. So don't be alarmed if you get a little bit of exhaust smoke from oil burning. Um, that is that is typical, and, and you've done a proper technique to preserve the engine while it was sitting. Um, transmissions. Transmissions tend to be a difficult area in the idea of conservation of, of vehicles. Um, for display and storage on manual transmissions, um, it's always a good idea to drain the fluid that is extent and flush the transmission with mineral spirits um, to remove any of the old oil. Um, and then refill it with a fresh synthetic gear oil, again, 75W90, 140, something of that grade. Um, and turn actually turn the, the transmission through all of its gears. Uh, that'll allow all the gears to be coated with a fresh coat of oil. 
um, again, an oxidation barrier, and then drain the case completely, just allowing the oil that is stuck to the gears to remain. Um, and then in automatic transmissions, again, you're in a hydraulic system. Um, you want to leave the fluid in if it's still there and is fresh. Um, if it if it seems to be degraded, if there's moisture in the transmission fluid, um, or it smells burnt, um, you would want to drain and refill the system so you have good, fresh, automatic transmission fluid uh, in the transmission. And one of the keys with that, as well as in the operational step, which we'll talk about next, is to make sure that you always use the proper transmission fluid in that space. Um, operationally, uh, manuals, very simple. Um, gear oil, proper gear oil in there. Um, early cars, for the people with early cars, um, a thicker oil may be needed, such as like Luberplate number eight. Um, and synthetic gear oils are always good. Uh, automatic transmission, drain the fluid of any unknown condition and refill it with the proper transmission fluid for production. Um, the rear differential, um, this very much like a manual transmission, um, you would want to drain it, flush it, and refill it with a synthetic gear oil, rotate, and then drain the system. Operationally, you just want to make sure you have the proper gear oil rating in there, viscosity rating. Again, synthetics are recommended. And early vehicles, again, you may require a thicker gear oil, something like a Luberplate number eight. Um, fuel systems should always be kept dry um, in, uh, on display or on, in storage. Um, you would want to drain the tank completely. Um, you can use air to blow it out and try to evaporate the fuel. Um, fuel lines can be blown dry with compressed air or sucked dry by a vacuum, um, somewhat like a vacuum pump for brakes. Um, carburetors should be blown dry with compressed air and a water displacing oil like WD-40. Um, could be sprayed through the carburetor to coat its um, coat the surfaces of it. Um, if you're going to make a vehicle operational, you want to make sure the tank is flushed and check for any debris. Um, use an inline fuel filter of, on your first runs to make sure you get, don't get any debris from the tank to the carburetor. Um, carburetors um, should usually be rebuilt. That way you ensure that you're not going to have any fuel leaks that eventually could cause an engine fire. Um, and fuel lines should be inspected and replaced if necessary, especially any rubber lines. Um, brakes, um, it's always a good idea to, with mechanical brakes on early vehicles, to lubricate all of the mechanical joints within it with a synthetic gear oil um, and work the brakes to make sure they're fully lubricated for display or storage. Hydraulic systems um, should be completely drained of any non-synthetic fluid. A DOT-5 synthetic should be put in. Dot uh, Non-synthetic brake fluids are hygroscopic and will attract moisture. DOT-5 synthetics will not. Um, so you should fully drain your system, flush it with ethanol, uh, let the ethanol, ethanol fully evaporate, and refill it with DOT-5. Um, you may need to replace seals um, if possible, um, if they are bad or you know, if, if there seems to be a problem with the synthetic um, and the seals. Um, in one of the vehicles at the Henry Ford, I was unable to replace the seals and uh, had to use the originals and just cleaned them very well with mineral spirits. Um, operationally mechanical, you want to have proper adjustment and lubricate the entire system so that you know that you're not going to have any binding or hanging up in the system. Um, on a hydraulic, you should again have the DOT-5 uh, being used. Um, ensure that the brakes are bled properly so you have even, um, even braking and adjust your brakes properly. Um, and the chassis, um, you would want to do a full chassis lubrication, um, whether you're displaying, storing, or operating, and use a synthetic grease. Um, I typically use a, a grease known as Allison. Um, it is produced by a company in Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, it, it does not break down as quickly as some of the other greases that are on the market. And then we have a list of some of the products that I mentioned in the uh, presentation. Great. I can um, post this list of products or the whole presentation possibly later uh, on the same page that the recording is posted. We should have that up in about a day or two. Is that the end of the presentation, Derek? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And that's the that's the end of that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. I uh, very informative. 
do, does anybody have any questions about the mechanical preservation of uh, the automobiles in your collection? Also, if you think of something later, those questions can be posted in the group discussion section on connectingthecollections.org. I might mention for the audience, too, if they click on those uh, links, like gunk.ca, it will open in a browser in, in the background. So you oh. may not be seeing it immediately, but you could go ahead and click on each of those three links and have them open and then save it however you want to later. Susan, if I pull over this um, list from Mary as well, will they be able to click on that? It's a PDF. Yeah, yeah they should yeah, be able so. to. Well, well, let's try it. Let's. All right, let's try. I don't want to cover up Derek's at the same time, so oh. let me see what I can do here. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention the evaluation that we ask participants to fill out. It just takes a couple minutes. It's about six questions, um, but it helps us in guiding us to build future presentations. So I'll post that link up there. Um, you know what? The I don't know that the vehicle references are working, but I can share that I'm PDF and people can download it right now if you'd like me to. You know, the first URL there is, a, is something I built that has this document. Um, so if they just even copy that down. And again, you know, I'll have this posted next to the recording later. If it just saves you copying and pasting it in. Now, will a link work that's been posted in the Q&A box? No. OK. If it were open chat, it could. Yeah, I'm. Well, I'll make it all available afterwards. Okay, but it is. I'm afraid time for us to wrap up. If anybody has any last questions, now is the perfect opportunity to type them into that Q and A box. But I don't see any, so I think that maybe we'll sign off. Okay, maybe evaluation link. Let's put that up there. Oh, great. I don't know if that's clickable. It's in the Q&A box. No, but they could copy and paste. You know what? Let's do this. There's the link for the evaluation. Just click on that, and it'll open in a separate browser window. Oh, thank you. Susan. And now, Kristen, if you, let's do this. Or Elsa, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, so there are two links in that chat window. Or are they the same thing? They're both the evaluation, I see. Mm -hmm. OK. If, if you want to copy and paste the link for the page for the vehicle's references, oh, sure. you could put it there. OK, hold on. Put that up. I just want to mention now on uh, November 9th is going to be our next live chat, and that's going to be about flag rolling and storage with um, Ann Ennis, who's a textile conservator at the Harpers Ferry Center at the National Park Service. So I hope that maybe some of these topics will overlap, and we'll have some of you online for that one as well. Great. OK, thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank you, Mary and Eric. You're welcome. Thank you. And and we'll hang out for a minute. So if you want to still ask Mary or Derek a question, feel free to do that in the, in the chat area.